Hey, good day, everyone, and uh, welcome back to uh, number eight in the 10 part series uh, regarding DNSSEC and uh, DNSSEC maintenance. I'm glad that uh, you guys are all here. We do have a uh, relatively large group. I know that we're living in some very strange times these days. So again, I do appreciate you being here and uh, maybe it'll give uh, some relief and uh, just some, some sitting around and listen to Alan talk about DNSSEC. Boy, it must be bad when people are enjoying listening to me talk about DNSSEC. Let's go ahead and get started. So today is April 1st of 2020, and uh, we are, as it says, on episode number eight. Today, we're going to talk about DNSSEC key rollover. And we talked uh, earlier in the series um, about the uh, differences in uh, the fact that there are some things that expire and some things that don't uh, within DNSSEC. Uh, the things that expire are the signatures, the things that do not expire are the things that actually create the signatures and are able to validate the signatures, and that is the keying material. Now, it is important that we do key rollover. We do want to be able to change our keying material, and because of the way DNSSEC is designed, it's really important to do this very carefully and very correctly. Otherwise, bad things are going to happen. So the ZSK and the KSK should be rolled from time to time. And by rolling, we obviously need to just change them. We may move from one key set of key material to another. Uh, there is the chance that someone can brute force uh, crack the keys. Um, but more likely is the case that a key will be stolen. Um, if you don't use something like a, uh, a hardware security module or an HSM, then there is the possibility that your keying material being just on a disk somewhere in your data center uh, could uh, gain legs and walk out. That is honestly at this point much more likely uh, than someone actually brute forcing your keys. Now the ZSK again is used only to sign the data in the zone, the authoritative data, and the KSK is used to specifically sign the uh, DNS key resource records. So the ZSK signs the authoritative data and the KSK signs the keys in the zone. Now, the DS record in the parent, if you remember from the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about this, the DS record is a hash of the key signing key. So all of the keys that make up the DNS sec or the DNS key resource record set are hashed together and then that key material, actually, I take that back. There is one per uh, key pair, and we'll see that uh, as, we, as we go into this further. Um, that information resides in the parent. When you do the validation of, a, uh, of DNSSEC, the DS record in the parent must match one of the available keys in the child zone. So when you change the key signing key, you also are required to change the DS record. If ever the two don't match, then your zone is not going to be able to be validated. And since there is an existing DS record in the parent, and that is the flag that says that the child zone must be signed, then you're going to have a zone that does not validate. And anybody that is doing DNSSEC validation is going to get a failure to validate. So key rollovers do need careful planning. Now, one of the things that I've always been, uh, uh, the way that I teach these things, um, basically anything that I teach, is that I make sure that people understand the underlying concepts before I make it really simple for them. So what you're going to see today is the manual mechanical method of going in and doing a key rollover. In the early days of DNSSEC, you know, back five or 10 years ago, this was basically the only way that you were able to do key rollover. Since then, a lot of work has been done and a lot of uh, blood, sweat, and tears has been uh, uh, exerted to provide a newer uh, mechanism of doing this. And so there is, and we'll be talking about it next week, a, a key and signing policy engine that is actually built into Bind. So today I'm going to explain to you what the CASP tool is actually doing under the covers and I'm going to show you that it can be done manually and in fact was done manually for many years in the past. So the uh, rollover times of your keys depend on your security requirements and the sizes of your keys. 
And the size of the keys, uh, again, deals a lot more with um, the RSA uh, mechanisms uh, where you actually specify a key length. Um, with some of the new, uh, the elliptical curve algorithms, you do not supply a key length. And uh, therefore, it's just the fact of what algorithm you're using as to, uh, you know, the, the length of time that you're going to want to specify between key rollovers. Now, if you are a high security zone, for example, a TLD, a banking site, uh, perhaps the military, you know, other forms of government, um, then you probably want to be a little bit more aggressive in your uh, key rollovers. For the zone signing key, you know, every 30 to 120 days. And again, with this being automated in newer versions of BIND, this can be lowered uh, without really much interference. Um, if you do these at a 30 to 120 days and you do it manually, then, you know, you're, you're going to learn how to do it. Your team is going to learn how to do it very well. Uh, but it's not, you know, it's, it's a little bit painful to necessarily do um, every, uh, every time um, and this often. Um, with your key signing key, um, every six to 12 months. Um, and again, the key signing key rollover is going to require you to modify the DS record in the parent. So yes, you could do these every 30 to 120 days, but since it requires the manual intervention with the parent, you probably don't want to do this as often. Now with a personal domain, um, the ZSK rollover, maybe every year, and the key signing key rollover, you know, maybe never, depending on how your, um, your algorithm survives the, uh, you know, the, the uh, attack that uh, occurs on cryptography uh, constantly. You know, if you, if you come across and you, if you've been signing your zone using an old or outdated uh, algorithm, then the best thing to do is, you know, to roll over uh, the key signing key and use a new algorithm. And we'll talk about doing an algorithm rollover very much later in today's segment. Um, now, one of the things, there is a, an RFC out, and then we'll talk about this in just a minute, but there, there's a lot of discussion as to whether you actually need cryptographically to roll your keys over. And it's basically come to the point of, you know, if you roll your key every 10 years, then you are going to be cryptographically safe as far as your keying material goes. The problem with rolling your key every 10 years is that at the end of 10 years, when it comes time to roll the key, nobody remembers how to do it. There is no, you know, nobody has been doing this, nobody's been practicing it. And again, it is a dangerous thing that if you do it wrong, your zone is going to go dark. So again, you don't necessarily need to do these because of cryptographic issues, but you definitely need to do these just to stay in practice. Um, so keys have a limited use of lifetime, but there is nothing programmed. They need to be replaced with new keys, and this is what we define as a key rollover, and care must be taken not to break the chain of trust. Now, one of the things here, you say, well, you just said that. We know the DS record has to match the key signing key and the child. The problem here is that DNS is only a loosely consistent database. It is not exact as in, you know, you make a change and everybody sees that change immediately. If you remember, you have these wonderful things called TTLs. So you have someone use your data, it is brought into their cache and is now kept for the TTL of that data. With things like your DNSSEC keys, your TTLs are probably relatively long because you know that this information is not going to be changing and therefore, you're going to be able to leave these, you know, unmodified. You don't want people to come back and get them, you know, every, you know, hour or two hours. So you're going to set a long TTL on the DNS key uh, resource records. Now, that's well and good as far as traffic management goes, but it does cause a little bit of an issue when your uh, keys need to be rolled over. And the only issue that it really causes is that it requires you to think and prepare well in advance because you can't just go in and change things and say, well, everything's going to be fine in five minutes because the TTL on your DNS key resource record set or the DS record in the parent may be, you know, a day or two days 
And in that case, if you just make the change under the covers without doing it correctly, then things may break and uh, you may go dark for a longer period of time. So there are, uh, the, the procedure uh, of introducing keys into the DNS zone and retiring the old keys is called a key rollover. And it is defined in RFC 4641, which was the DNSSEC operational practices. But that RFC is now obsolete and it was obsoleted by RFC 6781, which is the DNSSEC operational practices version two. So obviously version two is much better than version one. I would highly recommend that you go out and just take a look over 6781 because it actually is some really good uh, material and it's not written in a highly uh, technical manner. It is an operational practices document. So it is for those of us who are operators instead of necessarily those of us who are implementing the DNS protocol or the DNSSEC protocol. So do check these out. Again, RFC 4641 for the original version and then 6781 uh, for version two. So within each of the zone, remember that there are going to be two keys that are gonna to need to be rolled. There's this uh, KSK, the key signing key, um, and it has a dependency on the parent zone, the DS record that we've discussed too much. <laughs> and the ZSK, the zone signing key that is used to sign the authoritative zone content. Now, since there is no dependency on the parent zone in the ZSK, you can roll this key as often as you want, as long as you make sure that you don't have a, a signature in the zone, a, a, an RR SIG, that does not match up with an existing key, a ZSK in that same zone. But since you control all of that, it's actually very, very easy to automate. So there are two possible ways of doing key rollovers. The first is key pre-publication, and the second one is double signing. Now, each of these is used for a different thing, and we're gonna talk about each one of them and give you a, a nice little graphic that explains them right here. So pre-publication is used for rolling over a ZSK, so the zone signing key rollover. Pre-publication means that you're going to put the new key into the zone and make it visible, but don't use it to sign the zone. You continue using the old key to sign the zone. And then once you know that everybody that could possibly be caching data out of your zone has, you know, has the visibility of that new ZSK, then you're going to use it to sign the zone and at the same time, you're going to be removing all of the existing RR SIGs that exist with the old original key. What this is going to allow you to do is not create a double set of signatures because that's what double signing does. And it's used for KSK rollover. With double signing, what you're gonna do is you're going to actually use, you're gonna introduce the new key and you're going to sign the zone with both the new key and the old key. So now you're gonna have double signatures. Now that's not a big deal when you're doing it only on the DNS key resource record set. And if you remember the key signing key, the KSK is only used for signing the DNS key resource record set. So introducing a second key signing key and then double signing the entire zone only introduces one additional signature. So there will now be two RR SIGs on the DNS key resource record set. Now, if you went in, you can double sign your entire zone. You can use double signing for a ZSK rollover, but when you do that, you're going to end up with two signatures on every single resource record set. So that is going to make your zone significantly larger and you're gonna to need to be very careful, you know, that that doesn't overwhelm your, your secondary servers. Uh, just make sure, you know, you probably don't wanna do it. It's easy enough to do pre-publication for ZSKs and double signing for KSKs. So for a key rollover with pre-publication, this is in a number of steps. Now, step one actually contains four sub-steps. 
So within step one of key rollover with pre-publication, and again, remember, this is for your zone signing key. This is ZSK rollover. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to generate a new key for pre-publication. So you're going to run DNS site key gen, and you're going to use the same algorithm number as the one that you're using with your existing ZSK. We will talk about algorithm rollover a little bit later in this presentation. But for a key rollover where you're not changing the algorithm, and that's what you're going to be doing here, you are just going to use the same algorithm number. Now, if this is an algorithm that has a, a specified key size, yes, feel free to modify the key size, but do not change the algorithm number. Now, you're going to take that new key that you've just created, and you're going to publish it in the zone. So you're going to take that key, you're going to add it to the zone, whether you use NS update, whether you use, you know, cat to the end of the file, whether you use, you know, VI and you just go into the right place and you colon R and read the file in, it doesn't matter, but you're going to publish that new data while keeping the old key in the zone. So now you're going to have two zone signing keys. You're going to have the original one that was the one that you're rolling off of, and you're going to keep the one, or you're going to introduce the new one that you're rolling into. When you do your signing, you're only going to sign with the old key. So what this is going to do is it is going to now regenerate any needed signatures, but since it's using only the old key, the only ones that are going to be needed to be changed are ones that literally have timed out, ones that are, you know, getting ready to, to expire already. And it is going to re-assign the key signing key, I'm sorry, it's going to re-sign the DNS key resource record set. And in so doing, it's going to now make that new DNS key a trusted piece of information. So when at the end of this step one, you go out and you do a dig of your zone DNS key, you're going to see the KSK, which we haven't touched. You're going to see the ZSK, which is the, or you're going to see the old ZSK, the old, the original zone signing key. And you're going to see the new zone signing key. If you look at the resource record signature on the DNS key resource record set, it's going to cover all of those items. So now anyone that receives that DNS key resource record set is going to be able to validate and say, yes, there is this old key. And boy, look, all the signatures in this zone are still with the old key. And hey, how about that? There's a new one, but it's not actually used anywhere yet. So that is, you're, you're, you're done with step one once you have now completed that signing. Step two, and remember at this point, you're now waiting for everyone in the world to see both the old key and the new key when they do a lookup of your DNS key. Now you might say, well, it's gonna happen right away. Well, it might if they don't have it in a local cache. The problem is if you have a 24 hour TTL, anybody that has the DNS key resource record set already cached is only going to have the old zone signing key until that data expires from the cache in which case, you know, at that time, they will go out and they'll retrieve the key, DNS key and they'll now see both of them. So what you have to do is you have to wait, for, first of all, for the amount of time that it takes for your zone data to be transferred to all of your secondary servers. So if you have a multi-tiered architecture where you have secondary servers out with, you know, third-party vendors, or with, you know, if they're, they're out of the edges of the universe, then you need to make sure that that data has been transferred out to all of your secondary servers. You then need to wait the TTL of the DNS key resource record set. So if you have an 86400 TTL, then you have to wait 86400 seconds. And that is on top of the time that it took the zone to transfer to the secondaries. You then have to wait a safety factor. Now, how long is a safety factor? Well, I guess it all depends on how long you're willing to wait. Um, I personally would wait a day. Um, 
you know, you can wait a couple of hours, but all you're doing here is padding to make sure, make absolutely sure that anyone, even with a badly set clock, well, they're not gonna be able to do validation anyway, they are going to see the new and the old zone signing keys in the data when they do a lookup for the DNS key resource record set. Once that safety period has expired, you're then going to want to go in and sign the zone content, but only use the new zone signing key. You're not going to want to use the old one. Basically, you're going to let all of the existing RR SIGs fall off. You're going to want to get rid of all of the signatures that are associated with the, that old key. And instead, you're not going to want to delete the old zone signing key. You still want to leave it in there. And the reason is, of course, anybody that has resource records out there that they have in a cache, they may at some point or their downstreams may want to do validation. And if they have a cached resource record signature and they now go out and they want to validate this, they're going to go out and they're going to get the new, you know, or they're going to get the DNS key resource record set. And if it only contains the new zone signing key, then they're not going to be able to validate that zone. So at the step three here, you're going through, you're re-signing your zone, but you are only going to sign it, first of all, with the new zone signing key, and you're going to leave the old zone signing key in place. Moving on to step four, again, you have to wait the same length of time, kind of, because first of all, again, we have to wait for the zone transfer to the secondary servers. And then we have to wait the maximum TTL in the entire zone. Now, that was easy to see when we got our, you know, DNS key resource record set because we knew that it was all one TTL and there it is, it's 86400 or it's 1200 or whatever it is. Now, you're not waiting for that specific DNS key to expire. You're waiting for the longest possibly cached signature in the entire zone to expire. So if you have a resource record in there for www.example.com and it has a one week TTL because you know that you never change the IP address of your www server, then you are now in a holding pattern of a week. So sit around, write a note, you know, stick a post-it on the wall and wait for the maximum TTL used in the entire zone. What you're again waiting for is for the longest cached RR SIG to be forgotten by anybody in the entire world. Once this occurs, you wait a little bit longer. And again, how long should you wait? I don't really know. I would recommend at least a day. Waiting is something that's actually pretty easy to do. And uh, yeah, I'm getting a lot of practice in that these days. So you wait your safety factor and then you move on to step number five. Step number five, you actually remove the old zone signing key from your published data. And then you re-sign the zone with the only ZSK that is in the zone now. And that is the new one. And now no one has access from the outside world will have access to the old zone signing key. There are no signatures because of the amount of time that we waited previously. There are no additional signatures that use that old key hanging around. So we don't have to worry about anybody needing that zone signing key. So that's it. That is a pre-publication of a zone signing key. Let's talk a little bit now about, okay, well, actually take that back. Wow, yeah, we get to look at the cool graphic. So here is the ZSK uh, key rollover using pre-publication. And at the first time period, uh, the first clock there represents the time at which we begin doing our zone signing key rollover. And in this case, we see that we have an active key of ZSK sub old. So the old zone signing key is used from the beginning of our rollover until a period 
some place in the begin or in the middle there. Now we create our new zone signing key and we introduce it into the zone. We publish the key. We don't use it for signing though. So we wait whatever length of time this is. Well, that length of time is at least at a minimum the zone transfer length of time plus the TTL of the DNS key resource record set. Once that second time that once that time period has elapsed, then we're going to use the new ZSK for signing. We're going to again, you see the solid line there shows that this key is now the active key. We leave the old zone signing key in the zone because someone may still need to use it for validation. And now this length of time is the zone transfer plus the maximum TTL of the zone. And again, don't forget that you're going to want to leave some additional slack on both of these time periods just so that nobody ends up with either a signature that doesn't match a key or a key that doesn't match a signature. At this point, you're able to remove the old ZSK and we continue with the one and only zone signing key. Now, let's talk about the key signing key. And again, double signing. Double signing is a wonderful thing. It is a very easy way to do a key signing key rollover. And it differs only a little bit from a zone signing key uh, from the pre-publication. So let's talk about it a little bit here. So step number one is generate a new key signing key. Again, DNS set key gen dash FKSK with whatever options you gave it with the previous key. Now, what you do not want to do here, again, is introduce a new algorithm. Please, we'll talk about that later in the series, later today, don't do it in just a regular key rollover. Bad things will happen. You're going to publish the new key signing key in the zone. So again, VI or CAT or NS update, whatever you're gonna use, you put the new DNS key record into the zone. So now you're gonna have two key signing keys and at least one zone signing key. Now, this is where it differs from the pre-publication. You're going to want to use both of the keys to sign the zone. Now, if this were the zone signing key, you would have now ballooned up the size of your zone even more than it was before. But since this is the key signing key, and by default, the key signing key only signs the DNS key resource record set, you're now going to have two RR SIGs on the DNS key resource record set, and you'll be able to validate using either of the two keys in the zone. So step two, moving along, we now wait for the zone transfer time to the secondaries. Again, we wait the TTL of the DNS key resource record set. And now we wait for the new DS record to appear in the parent zone. So we basically put a timer in place. Uh, we, we send the DS record up to the parent and we just hang out and wait for it to appear. And you can't see me, but I'm, I'm sitting here swaying back and forth, just waiting for that new DS record to show up. Once that new DS record shows up in the parent, you can't just start using it. You have to wait again, the TTL, but this time the TTL of the DS record in the parent zone. So if that DS record in the parent was a two day or a four day or a two hour time period, whatever that time was, you need to wait and what you're waiting for is for anyone that had cached the old DS record, wait for it to vanish out of the zone. And again, you wait a safety factor. You pick your own safety. You figure out how long it, how long do you feel safe that nobody out there is caching it longer than that TTL. Step three, we're going to remove the old key signing key, re-sign the zone with the new key signing key, and we're done. So we dropped off a couple of steps and we don't have this big crisscrossy thing of, you know, only using one key to sign at one time and another key to sign at another time, but have both of them in the zone, blah, blah. 
All we're doing now is we insert both of the keys, we sign with both of the keys, we wait a length of time, then we rip out one of the keys and continue on as we were. This works if you do the entire zone. You can do a ZSK rollover with double signing, but you're not going to like the fact of how large your zone gets because of every single resource record having two signatures. So once we're done with this, all's good. Fantastic. It all worked. Excellent. So let's look at this in graphics because I like these little graphics. And I would like to thank, uh, I think Karsten Straltman did these originally and I've updated him a couple of times since then, but these were, uh, these were some, some great visuals on uh, how the key signing key and zone signing key key rollover actually work. So in, the, in a double signature situation, you're going to, again, the first clock is the beginning of our key rollover scenario. We have our key signing key old. We are going to create a new key signing key. We're gonna send the DS to the parent and we're gonna put the new key signing key into the zone. Both of these keys are now actively used for signing the zone. We see that the new DS record has appeared in the parent. And again, this is not something that there is a necessarily a, you know, it will appear in three hours. This is going to be, you know, whenever your upstream provider decides that they're going to get around to, you know, taking your data and stuffing it into the zone. Now, as soon as this new DS record is in the zone, Anybody that's doing validation is going to be using the new key signing key, but anyone that has the old DS record still cached is going to be uh, doing validation using the old key signing key. And therefore, we're going to need to make sure that both of these remain in place. So even when this new DS record shows up in the parent, the old key signing key remains, the new key signing key remains, and we now have to wait the TTL of the DS records set in the parent. So overall, this is going to be the zone transfer time plus the TTL of the DNS key resource record set plus however long it takes for that DS record to show up in the parent. So at a minimum. So at the, at the bottom here, that is the absolute minimum is the zone transfer time plus the TTL of the DNS key RR set. Now, it's also going to be affected by the TTL of the DS record in the parent and how long it takes the DS record to appear in the parent, but it is going to be at a minimum the zone transfer time plus the TTL of the DNS key resource record set. At that point, you're able to remove the old key signing key, and we now only have one, and so it is now KSK, and we move forward with life. So that works as long as everything is scheduled and everything is going well and you have no issues. You know, you have this plan six months in advance. Everybody has practiced it a couple of times. Everybody's ready. You know, you got everything ready to go. What happens when there's an emergency? What happens in an emergency key rollover? What if the private portion of your key signing key or zone signing key is leaked out to the public? So now you need to replace those keys because somebody has access to your keying material, but there's no such thing as speeding up a key rollover. You cannot change those time periods that I listed on the previous slides. If you do, things will break. Because of the DNS caching, immediate removal of the old keys is going to break legitimate zone data. Now, bad, the, the bad guy with the, the keying material is going to be able to fake your zone until you get that key rolled over. But if you break the legitimate data while the bad guy is doing bad stuff with, you know, what he can now get people to validate, you're even in worse case. Now, there are some things that you can do to make an emergency key rollover a little bit less painful. And one of those things is to produce and install a set of emergency keys. So what you can have is a set of keys, zone signing key and a key signing key that are able to sit in your zone 
not used. So they're not going to be active keys. They're just going to be, and you, usually you would do this with a key signing key because again, zone signing key, you don't have to wait for the parent. You're going to have to wait for some TTLs, but you're not going to have to wait for the parent to do anything. And an emergency, you're still going to have to wait the period. If you pre-publish a key signing key, then you're able to do and have a pre-published DS record that matches that key signing key in the parent then you're able to switch over to that new emergency key and all you have to do is turn it on. All you have to do is activate the key. If you remember the PAIRD um, settings that you can do use on uh, DNSSEC KeyGen for the automation portion, all you're gonna do is set the activation on that standby emergency key to none. When you have a key that has a, an, an, an autom a, a time, and that an activation time of none, it's just going to sit there and it will not be used to sign the zone data until you set the activation time or manually use it to sign. Now, the thing to be concerned about here is that if somebody is able to get your key signing key or zone signing key private data, how are you going to keep them from getting the emergency key rollover key private portion at the same time. So what you will need to do is go in there and somehow, whatever your mechanism is going to be, make the public portion visible. Obviously it's going to be published in the zone. Take the private portion offline. Take that private portion and store it in a vault somewhere. Put it in, uh, you know, a, put it on a USB stick that is in a, you know, a safety deposit box, obviously that you can get to, you know, in a time of emergency. But you can't speed it up anymore. You're still going to have to wait for those TTLs to expire. The thing that you're gaining with an emergency rollover key is the ability to not have to wait for the DS record in the parent to be changed because you're already going to have one in there. So the successful DNSSEC key rollover depends on, you know, four things. The first thing is documentation. What is your way of doing this? And then the other three are practice, practice, and more practice. Set up a zone, you know, you're in operations, you're doing this stuff on a day-to-day -day basis. Set it up in such a way that you can do testing on a zone that you own. You know, set up a child zone that has a separate KSK, separate ZSK, and if it breaks, it doesn't matter. You know, set up dnssec.mydomain.com and then go in and play around with the key rollover. Go in and play around with resigning. Algorithm rollover. I said we were going to talk about it in this meeting or in this, in this uh, episode, and so we are. At some point, it might be necessary to roll your key algorithm because, and the, and the reasons behind this might be because the crypto algorithm is showing a weakness. So for example, the MD5 SHA-1, uh, you don't want to be using an MD5 SHA-1 key today because it just isn't a good quality uh, algorithm for your, your key material. And it could possibly be, you may want to do an algorithm rollover because the new algorithm or algorithm number enables additional functions. So we didn't talk about it a lot, but in the very beginning uh, of DNSSEC deployment, there was a difference between a zone that was signed with SHA-1 using INSEC for negative uh, uh, proof of, uh, for proof of non-existence and for SHA-1 that was using INSEC-3 for proof of non-existence. Because at the beginning, you could have a, uh, a validating recursive server that knew how to do SHA-1 and INSEC, but it did not know how to do SHA-1 and INSEC-3. So in that case, what you were going to want to do was do an algorithm rollover to get away from, you know, to, or to add the features of the SHA-1 INSEC-3. Well, nowadays, all of the algorithms support INSEC3 because all of our recursive servers support INSEC3. So that isn't going to be the one thing. 
but there might be a new feature in a new algorithm that you might want to move to. Now, I've been really nice and I've told all the stuff about algorithm rollover, but I'm not gonna tell you how to do it because I don't want to get anybody to a point where they think that, oh, all we do is we follow these three steps and it's just gonna work. All I'm gonna say is there is an RFC that says how to do this. You can find it, study it, research it, test it, test it, test it. Because what it is going to involve doing is inserting a key signing key into your zone and not having it active. Uh, and you'll have, actually, I take that back. You're going to have signatures in your zone for a key that does not exist in the zone. Yeah, think about that for a second and you'll understand why I'm going to move directly on to questions and comments. And they will not, I will not, I promise you, tell you how to do an algorithm rollover. You're going to need to do that on your own. So with that said, are there any questions or comments? Yeah, there, there are two questions. I'm <clears throat> still absorbing the, we're not going to do the rollover. But um, so Josh is asking, does the KSK sign itself to produce an RR seg? Yes. Well, it, it's okay. So the key signing key is used to sign the entire DNS key resource record set. So the DNS key RR set is going to have a signature and it will be produced by the key signing key. So it's not just the KSK, it's the combination of all of the DNS keys, you know, KSKs, ZSKs, whatever, all of those are gonna have a signature produced by the key signing key. Okay, um, another question, uh, some of these, probably kind of roll back and forth, but let's see. Uh, if you go back to slide 16. I can do that. Actually, I can't do that. Hold on one second. <laughs> Woo! Yes. Okay, so the question from Praveen is, why do you need to re-sign with a new KSK? Uh, the new it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that, so huh. You must mean with a new ZSK. Okay, so the, the issue here is that when you remove the old ZSK, you're obviously changing data in the zone, and therefore you have to resign the zone. Now, resigning the zone is the easy part of this. Removing the old ZSK um, is actually a little bit more difficult because the first thing you have to do is make absolutely sure that you're removing the correct zone signing key. Because if you remove the wrong ZSK, um, you've just undone your rollover. So again, um, yes, you do have to resign, um, and you're going to use the only zone signing key, which hopefully is the new one. Right. So here's a question that um, I'm going to ask you, Alan, but if any of the attendees have an answer, uh, feel free to type it into the chat. Um, Mark is asking um, if anybody knows if the private part of a ZSK or KSK for any domain has ever been stolen or made accidentally public. I can't think of it. Of a no, I'm not aware of any. And yeah, I mean, th this is one of the times that if you're, if you're, if you're sit your, your systems are obviously need to be secure. Um, if you're doing DNSSEC, you need who think about, you know, is this something that we want to invest, you know, 30,000 US dollars in a, uh, you know, a, uh, an, a hardware security module, or are we good with our, you know, Unix admins doing their, their thing and, you know, providing encrypted disks, uh, providing, you know, logins that only have access um, to, you know, the key material, things along those lines. No, I'm not aware of any, um, so I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't either. I mean, I know I, I have a couple of t-shirts that have public keys printed on them, but um, yeah, uh, that's a good point. Um, you know, uh, there isn't really any established history of uh, people stealing or leaking private keys. So here's a, here's a uh, suggestion comment from Ralph. How about using DNSX set time to set active and expired times for keys? 
Yes, absolutely. DNSSEC set time is kind of the intermediate between what I've shown the, the manual section here and the heat automation using CASP, which I'm going to show next week. Um, so, so DNSSEC set time allows you to modify the metadata. And if your zone is in um, automatic maintenance, then BIND itself is going to see the metadata and automatically activate and deactivate keys as necessary. Um, so yes, absolutely, that is, a, that is a fantastic way of going about doing it. Uh, I would actually recommend that if you're not doing this already, um, wait till next week and let me show you how good the CASP, uh, you see how good the, the built-in functionality is, and uh, you're going to be you're going to be really happy. Uh, of course, you have to have 9.16 to, to this use. This is true. That. Yeah. So um, here's a uh, question from Bob: Does the parent remove the old DS record when they add the new DS record? Yes, under normal circumstances, there is only a single DS record unless you have a, uh, you know, a standby emergency key. Um, under normal circumstances, they're going to remove the old DS record as soon as they insert the new one, which is a problem that some people have run into that they will go ahead and they'll get this data, you know, they'll, they'll get it all wired up and, and ready to go. They'll generate the new key, they'll generate the new DS record. And then for some reason, they'll decide that it's a good idea to send that DS record up to the parent. Now, a, a nice parent, a well-behaved parent, will check to make sure that that DS record actually matches what is in the child, but not all of them do. And if the upstream says, okay, here, we're gonna put that new DS record in, they're gonna rip out the old one, and congratulations, you have now just invalidated your entire zone while trying to do the right thing. Okay, um, is a... Uh, Slightly snarky comment from Gabriel saying, ISC provides consultation services if you need help rolling an algorithm. I think that's in response to your uh, saying about how to roll an yeah, algorithm. Yeah, Gabe, Gabe's allowed to give me, give me some crap. I, I, it's a, that, that's good. Um, we're, we're, we're friends and that, that, that is all well. I'm actually really, really impressed that you've hung in through this entire series, Gabe. And you've only, that's the only snarky comment that I've seen. So thank you. <laughs> okay, so yeah, he says it's not snarky. Anyway, so. Um, <laughs> Fair uh, Josh has pointed out that there are a lot of outages caused by incorrect KSK rollovers and Arson mentioned that there are zones out there where people accidentally publish their private key and I, I have heard of that as well. Um, so it's not quite the same as somebody stealing it, much more of a self foot shoot. Uh, well, to actually publish the private portion of a DNS key, you have to really, really do it badly because by default, BIND does not generate anything that is in the right format to be included in a zone file. So the only way that that would actually be done is if somebody like wrote a blog post and said, hey, we're going to be doing our key rollover and here's the key material and they publish that. I've seen them included in text records before. Mm -hmm. Oh, God. Okay, that's, yeah, don't do that. Don't do that. That's bad. Um, uh, so Ralph mentioned that DNS accept time is available in 9.11. Yes. Um, and uh, there's another comment um, from Ralph. The Center for Internet Security has a new draft security benchmark for 9.11 and would appreciate any feedback. So if you have a link for that, Ralph, stick that in the comments too. Yeah, that would be, I'd be interested to see um, I don't, obviously I'm not, I'm not familiar with it, so I wouldn't like, I wouldn't want to give any, uh, any offhand comments, but uh, yeah. So again, everybody, it's been wonderful. Um, I appreciate you uh, donating your time to, uh, to listening in on this. I hope it has been useful to you. Um, we will be back again next week uh, talking about some of the additional automation pieces um, with that are available in bind. We're going to be talking about the, uh, the CASP tool and some other things. Um, between now and then, uh, keep your social distance, uh, keep your hands washed, and uh, have a wonderful week. We will see you next week. And of course, I can't get back to. <laughs> have a great day, everybody. All right. Thanks, Alan.
I want to play my music. There it is.